All right, we're ready? I think so. <laughs> we're, we're on the record. So. On the record. All right, welcome everybody back to another episode of Social Business Hour. This is episode number 37 of 2015. I'm your co-host, Brian Fanzo, better known as iSocialFans on the Twitters, joined every single Monday for a really long-ass time at this exact time, 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Pacific, wherever else you live, you can figure out the math yourself. How are you today, Rachel? I am freaking awesome. I'm having a great day. So I love Mondays. Um, so I hope everybody is having an equally great day. I am as well. It's something about the community. It's something about um, the awesomeness that is our social business, our community. It's at the end of my day here on the East Coast, but it's one of those things that living in Arizona was always like my favorite part of the day and it actually usually inspired me to be pretty motivated. So usually when I get off here, I, I do get some work done, which is actually, you know, probably a pretty good goal after we do it. We spend all this time together, but um, I'm excited. We're talking, uh, we've been talking this entire month and oh, Bruno joins us. Hey, Bruno, it's been a while. I haven't seen you. Glad to have you back in, but it's 10 p.m. in France, so that's good to know. And I believe it's like 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. in Australia, for those of you that are out there. Um, but um, I'm excited to talk. We've been talking influencer marketing pretty much all month. And Rachel, you and I live in this space. This is where we work in, um, even you more so than me. And we've had this debate. It was a great topic. We had a great guest, Amy Tennyson from IBM last month our last episode. Uh, the episode before we got, um, we got blab bombed by the great Brian Kramer and Brian Kramer dropped his insights on uh, influencer marketing. And today's topic, I can tell you, for those of you guys that are listening and th how's it going, everybody that's in the chat. If you're listening on blab, use the hashtag SBizHour. We also monitor and manage that on the Twitters. So our amazing community manager who you saw on camera dropping that knowledge about if you have your speakers muted, you can't hear anybody. That was Kristen Cardos, our awesome um, community manager. And she actually manages Twitter, our comments section, the gatekeeper for this chat. So um, we're really lucky to have her. So if you want to if you want to put us in a second tab and then uh, switch on over to um, Twitter, you can do that as well. Or you can join us in the comments section. But we're going to get down into a little bit more about influencer marketing. And I can tell you, Rachel and I spent about two hours earlier today about this topic and the questions for today. So um, I'm fired up because it's not that we uh, disagree, but I wouldn't say that we agree on everything. So uh, you want to preference this, Rachel? I think you're the one that the brains, as always, the brains behind this topic and this, uh, this kind of conversation today. Yeah, I think before we get started, I just kind of wanted to go over to kind of frame the conversation a little bit, I guess. So in my mind, at least, um, there are multiple buckets of influencers um, when specific to influencer marketing. So for today's discussion, we're going to keep it uh, fairly simple. We're going to keep it to three. So first, we're going to have your experts, like your subject matter experts. You have your thought leaders, and then you'll have your social amplifiers. All equally important in a successful influencer marketing campaign, but all very different. They have you know different hats, different roles and different uh, goals that you can reach with each of them. So if anybody uh, right off the bat has a question about those different personas, um, shout it out. And we actually, we're gonna keep it pretty open and fast and loose today. So if you wanna jump on camera at any time, just raise your hand and uh, Christian Curtis will make it happen. Um, so I'm curious, you know, this isn't something that we hear talked about a lot, Rachel. Um, we hear personas when we're talking about targeting and we hear influencer marketing. And honestly, I think of uh, some people, have, there's kind of two, you know, at least from my experience, people come at influencer marketing from like a couple different places. They're either an influencer themselves and all of a sudden some brand decided, hey, I'm going to give you this stuff for free. Let your audience know. Or maybe they're, they've heard of influencer marketing. They think of Beyonce. They think of Kim Kardashian. And they say, those are influencers. People pay them money to, to hawk a product. But I think when you break it down to an expert, an amplifier, and a thought leader, I think it's slightly a cluster in your mind on really what that means. Because I love it. I think it's time that we kind of refocused and, and really personalization is key, but also having a strategy is extremely important. I hammered that home at Periscope Summit all week. Everybody that's doing live streaming does not give you an excuse to not have a strategy. So I love it. Let's get into question number one and we'll bring in people on air, but we'll also kind of uh, everybody that's watching. So those three personas are your expert, your social amplifier, and then your thought leader. And we are kind of caveating with those three, but we're also saying all three are important and all three have value. So get into question one, what is the criteria that makes up each one of those pieces? So uh, Rachel, I'll kind of let you kick off of that. And I'll jump in as well. 
Okay. Um, so for me, um, a expert or subject matter expert has a relatively niche focus. Um, they're very incredibly well versed on a certain topic um, and incredibly knowledgeable. They're they're big in their community. It, it, the size of that community may vary, uh, but people definitely look to them for strategic advice on their area of expertise. Um, a thought leader for me is more of an industry expert, so it's a broader term, and that has to do with somebody who may also have a niche focus, but is also hyper aware of everything in the entire industry. They're well connected. They're in their peer group of other thought leaders, um, and they're kind of looking at what has come before, what's available today, and what's likely to you know, come about in the future. So they're definitely shaping their industry. Um, and then a social amplifier, um, my definition is more of based on audience and eyeballs. They have a large social following. So they're able to amplify like crazy anything that you throw at them. So first of all, I have to give a shout out because I love those examples. But I have to give a shout out to um, the group over at Where03. So um, I actually was able to meet Jennifer, one of the team members over there, and she has tweeted out a picture of the three of them together. And she said, a team that blabs together stays together. So um, I love that. Not only do we get awesome people joining us from all over, but um, we have a, a team there hanging out. So um, And uh, Kristen Cardos, yeah, the topic change is not working for me for some reason. Um, so I just tweeted at you the topic change. If you could change it for that, that would be awesome. So I love how you changed that. And Rachel, you know, we were brainstorming about this earlier. And really the differences between each of these are are, are pretty strategic and they pretty, you know, they have different roles. And so on, um, I want to bring in a comment here that we heard. Um, and and Felice, you know, Phyllis said, so is this amplifier a social a super fan? And I actually think it's a super social person. It doesn't necessarily have to be a super fan. It's that idea of a large audience, a large digital footprint. Um, and they can do mass amplification, which means lots of eyeballs, lots of word of mouth. Then you have the experts and the and the thought leaders. And I can tell you, um, for me, the reason I think this was really, Rachel, we had a pretty good debate earlier, is I've actually targeted each one of these in my career. So, you know, at, at a different part of my career, I decided, hey, I'm an expert. I'm focusing on being an expert. And then I said, hey, I'm making a pivot and I'm focusing on being a social amplifier, and I'm really an influencer that is that is looked at in the social space as someone that can amplify a message. And now I'm, I've kind of tweaked that, and I'm focusing more on targeted thought leadership. But I guess for me, there's another piece of this. What criteria makes this up? I think the criteria actually makes it up not only what your relationship is to the brand or what you're influencing, but your relationship to the community and where you're at in your experience. And, and Rachel, you were hammering that home with me when I was challenging you earlier with Devil's Advocate. And you kept saying, well, you know, experience matters also. So I'm curious, where where's your thoughts on experience in there? And then we'll bring in some of the questions that I see rolling through here. Well, experience and also relativity to the brand is huge. And that can't be overstated. Even if you're coming to the party as an amplifier, you still have to have an affinity. I don't think pay to play, even as an amplifier, works as well as somebody who is known a little bit in the community. Um, otherwise, you know, you, you're not going to see their stream. So you kind of have to, whether you're picking up on a hashtag, you still need to have some relevance and some context to even drive someone to retweet um, or favorite your activity on social. So the criteria, I think, even though for an amplifier, it's based around audience size, they still have to have a fair reputation with the brand that they're choosing to amplify for. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest, especially in today's day and world, you don't grow a big footprint, you don't grow a big social following without actually putting in a hell of a lot of work and a lot of effort and having kind of an understanding of what you're doing, right? I think, you know, the days of the paid followers and having, you know, I, I was talking to somebody at the Periscope Summit last week and they were like, well, I, for all my influencer work, I use that audit score and I run an audit on every single person that I work with. And if that audit comes back and 80% of their Twitter followers are fake, I don't even think about them. So I think when I think of social amplification and, and Phyllis wrote another question here, I actually doesn't, I don't think it matters if it's an affiliate or it promotes for free. I don't think that um, differentiates between each one of these categories. What I think that really where it comes in is it's really what is the, what does success look like when this person is amplifying? And I think of that amplifier, it's total word of mouth. It's impressions on a hashtag. It's letting a massive amount of audience know. And then you have the expert and the thought leader where the expert, when that expert does you know, make a comment or do, whoever is listening to that expert, they're, they're, that trusted relationship of a subject matter expert is going to close the deal or, or kind of push it forward. So I don't actually think it, um, it matters as much between each category, but I, I think the key there is understanding 
what the value is that they're providing to the brand. Yeah, because even if a brand is sourcing amplifiers, they're still going to make sure that, you know, when they do their research, that they're not talking bad about the brand, you know, that they're still well connected and well perceived. Well, um, otherwise, friend, we're, audience means nothing. And we're on Meerkat here as well. And our friend Keenan, Jim Keenan, shout out to Jim Keenan, is actually on the Meerkat. And he said it has to be an engaged audience. No, lots of followers always doesn't mean amplification. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Rachel, because we kind of discussed that a little bit. Yeah, for me, amplification and impressions is a purely mathematical activity. Um, I think if you're looking to drive um, action and advocacy, community matters, and that's where engagement plays an incredibly vital role. But for pure amplification, size matters. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're just looking to drive impressions on a hashtag, the bigger you're following, the bigger the impressions. JS, Hi. how's it going, my friend? Good, good. How are you doing? Doing wonderful. I what say you? Mondays. My Mondays with the two Brian's and the Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> so hey, uh, just one Brian today. Well, the other well, Brian was yeah. an hour before. <laughs> you earlier, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's true. H to H. Here we go. So, um, well, I'd asked uh, um, uh, a couple of questions, but one, uh, the first question I was wondering about you. You see a lot of influencers out there that get treated by their followers or the people they have a sphere of influence over as experts. Um, and often you see this being exploited by brands, by products, by services. Do you feel that the influencers should have a sense of responsibility in terms of when they are saying things as opposed to opinion versus learned uh, opinion or knowledge? Um, is it okay if they exploit the fact that they are being looked at as experts? Well, I say I mean, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rachel. Well, we always say that influence is subjective, and I really feel that so is expertise. Um, and although it's easy to do research and work out if their expertise matches either your opinion or what you, you know, how you want to be perceived as a brand. So, um, do your research. I mean, someone could pose as an expert, but then if you, you know, do a little Googling and work out there just echoing the thoughts of somebody else, then perhaps you should go to the original source versus just taking the uh, expert light option. And, I, and I, will, I will say, hell yes. And I will quote the quote. I actually said it on stage and little Spider-Man here with um, great influence comes great power, but also great responsibility. And I feel any influencer that doesn't understand the value of sometimes saying, I don't know, I'm not a good fit for your brand, or maybe I'm just taking this and amplifying the message and have no expert knowledge in this exact subject. If you are not willing to do that, you will alienate your brand. You'll alienate your community. And that trust is gone. It, you, it is so hard. I, I can tell you, to me, that is the scariest part. Every time someone says they want to work with me, they want to connect with me, they want to build. I, For me, the relationship I have with my audience is far more important than any one brand. Therefore, one brand that tells me to hawk something or even a brand that tells me what to tweet because I'm very much the, the guy that if you want to, if as soon as a brand tells me what to share, it's tweaking what I do great. And what I do great is I understand what my community wants. So I, I think it's a great question. And I actually think it's an interesting conversation because I think influencers before took anything that came their way, they got an affiliate code, they put really great SEO behind it, and anybody that Googled it found their affiliate code, and then they all of a sudden had influence. I think the brands today, I say, you know, the brands I work with on Periscope especially, I say, give me an influencer code that allows me for 24 hours. So while someone's watching my replay and has an affiliate code, that I can prove that I have influence. Once that 24 hours is over, make it disappear because I'm not proving that I have great SEO and that I can share it out to all these people. I'm proving that by listening to my insights and my influence, they're actually going to make a decision and make an action. I think that's the difference in today's influence. Beautiful. I, I've got a couple more questions. Uh, Rachel, Brian, let me know when uh, I've worn out my welcome and you need the seat. Um, so based on that, then, shouldn't it be OK for Brian Fonzo to make tons of money, become quite wealthy uh, doing whatever he wants to do in this role of being an influencer? That's a great question. Um, I wish that was the case. <laughs> um, oh, I know. We've, we've talked about this we've talked a little. About so I think part of it, you kind of run into a, a sticky situation, right? And I think this is where, where really Rachel kind of was hitting it on the head. I think at some point, some brands look at somebody that is an influencer. And, and if someone is passed across as an influencer, it becomes a talking head. 
I believe their their expertise is then no longer valued, right? And then someone's asking them for free. And I think a lot of times brands expect so much for free that when an influencer is a, a influencer is an expert as well as a social amplifier and is striving to become a thought leader, monetizing that is hard because they say, why the hell am I going to pay you when I can just tweet out and give these five people a free t-shirt and they're going to tweet it out? Now, if they understand the difference, they understand that that influence and that trust that I have with my community is going to get them to actually pull the trigger or actually listen instead of just even not listening and maybe get the same amount of, of quote unquote reach. So that'd be my thoughts. What are your thoughts, Rachel? Um, in light of the personas that we defined earlier, yeah, I mean, I there, there should be a there's a reciprocal value exchange. So whether it's monetary or otherwise, even as a social amplifier, there still has to be something in it for you. Um, so I think that's important when you're building out your campaign strategy. You can't just ask people to do something because you need it to be done. There it still has to be an exchange. Um, so yeah, Brian, <laughs> I can't speak for Brian. I'm sure he does want to make a lot of money doing what he's currently doing. Um, I think connecting with the right people will make it happen. May just be that we're still very early in terms of influencer currency, if you will. Well, um, yeah, and, and direct measurement. And I also think one thing that I've kind of learned is, you know, um, and we're going to get to this question a little bit in the, in, the, in the next question, actually, about talking about niches and really kind of carving out your niche. I've hated that. When someone told me that I have to have a niche, it, 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 it makes my skin crawl because I, I it didn't take me. Until, I think I was 30 when I found out that really being a generalist is really what I'm good at. I'm good at understanding and knowing a lot of stuff and being really able to adapt that. But, you know, when someone says they're, a, you know, if they're a specific, you know, I'm a four door car, you know, I'm a minivan influencer right. and you're only focusing on minivans. That's, that's impressive. That's a niche. But for me, I, I'm not, if anyone knows my ADHD personality is I'm not only going to not focus on one niche, I'm going to focus on a much bigger picture. So I've actually tweaked my strategy, and I think we'll get into this in a little bit, but I'm now focusing on thought leadership more so than just becoming a, a subject matter expert on one platform. And I'm, I'm taking a broader role of having experience, working with brands, doing the work myself, but also listening to every other influencer and allowing me to connect influencers with influencers. I think that's a hard, that's, it's a hard space. and I'm by far not there yet, but to answer your question, that's kind of my way of saying, okay, brands, I'm going to prove it to you by kind of go, reaching at a, at a, a larger um, audience as well as a larger kind of uh, harder goal to achieve, I guess, if that makes sense. What, uh, what data sets uh, are you looking at either for yourself in terms of increasing your sphere of influence or getting a better understanding of who you are out there, uh, as well as maybe influencers that you look at or other data sets that you might ask potential brands and other people to pay attention to who might be interested in you? Well, I default to Rachel Miller on that for the first, okay. because Rachel is the social, I mean, that's what she does. I mean, she works with, I mean, that's the, I think that's important because not only is it understanding what metrics matter to you as an influencer, but honestly, metrics don't matter for me as an influencer if the brands aren't looking for those. And I can tell you, I've learned that the hard way. I've had a brand tell me that they could pay me twice as much as if I had a hundred thousand followers on Twitter than if they're paying me right now, because I have 50,000 followers on Twitter. So for me, that's like mind boggling. They, but they talk to you about engagement though. Cause so, I see people with 50,000 followers who are like dead, they're dead meat. Your people are heavily engaged with you. Doesn't that have a greater value? Rachel Miller, what say you? Most definitely. Um, and that comes down to what the particular brand is looking for. So I know for me, when I'm building out campaigns for brands, the personas for me come in handy because you do need that amplification factor. You need to build awareness. So those high profile social amplifiers are the first part of your campaign. Then you need your experts who can actually drive discussion about very specific things in and around your product or service. And they need your thought leaders because you need them to then talk to their peers. Again, it's kind of more of that amplification opportunity. So you go after everybody has influence. There's no denying that. But you need yeah. to target people with specific influence to reach your overall goals. And I think that's what we're talking about today. Like no one's saying that some people have more influence than others. It's just different influence. And you need to tap those in and hone it. Um, to what you're trying to, your business objectives are. And I can tell you, you know, I was at the Paris Cup Summit this past week, and it was probably one of the most uh, surreal experiences I've ever had at any event. It was amazing. It was inspiring. And I can tell you, when I got off stage, 
um, after my keynote, the amount of um, visibility and praise and all these things that I got were amazing. But the crazy part was I didn't say anything that I haven't said in a Periscope before. And I, I, I thought back and said, what the heck? And really what it came down to is I had the, the eyeballs and the attention of a lot of big names that have huge social amplification range. And I had the Periscopers that have 50,000, 100,000 followers in this, in this room. And they all of a sudden heard me and shared my message, right? They, they started tweeting it and they started, and all of a sudden my message started to have more power. And this is coming from the guy that doesn't believe in the, that your, uh, numbers makes you more influence. Uh, it doesn't make you a better influencer, but I will tell you for me to drive change, which I'm really working hard to in the Periscope community, I think it would be extremely hard and almost idiotic for me to think that although I believe my community is more engaged, my smaller numbers were going to make that change extremely harder to achieve. And the fact that I got these powerful social amplifiers on my team now, and they believe in, in, in team, uh, we are greater than me. That to me is going to allow me to have a, far bigger influence than I, than I ever could imagine. And I think that's probably a, a change in mindset for me that happened just last week. And it was based on Rachel's discussion with this topic. So you appreciate all the love, but not all the love is necessarily equal. Correct. That's a great way of, great way, great way of putting it. JS, JS, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Mr. Jed Record, how are you, my friend? I feel like I saw you every week for four weeks straight, and then last week I didn't see you. I've missed you, my friend. How are you? And the the one event I miss is is that amazing note. So thank goodness for the scopers that were scoping it so I could watch along. <laughs> Big indeed. So what say you, Jed, on this topic? I, I was actually, when uh, Rachel and I were discussing it earlier today, I was actually very interested. I was thinking of you and what your uh, insights were on there. Because I think... Not only is this kind of new and leading edge, but I think it's also kind of a way of, um, you know, shaping how people not only think of their careers, but where they engage and focus their time on. Yeah, so I had to come in because we're talking about, you know, a, a thing that's kind of near and dear to me. Is, and influencer marketing is, is so important for firms because they're out to change uh, perception, right? That's, that's what they're looking the influencers to do for the influencers to for them and to change they're looking to change perception across a large scope not just uh, a couple of people if they wanted to do that for, for 100 or 1000 people they could invite them to the conference and and have them all in a room and and get their own people in there and talk with them so for influencer marketing on a larger scale uh, IBM is a great example so they're a client of yours Brian and I think everybody in this lab has heard of IBM, right? So when they hire an influencer to share, uh, you know, information about an IBM product or service, it, it's not the 80% or 60% that they already have a favorable rating on, on IBM or the even 80 or 90% that have heard of IBM You're, as a, as a marketing uh, CMO or, or or as a firm, and you're trying to get to that last 10 or 20 percent who haven't turned over and, and said, "Oh, I want to have an IBM product or service." So when you have a huge market share like IBM or some other large uh, corporation in a similar market, um, it's that last 10, 20, 30 percent that are the most difficult to reach. And the only way you do that is by getting influencers that have have a much broader reach and the numbers, like you said, the numbers matter because you are trying to reach the last 10%, the holdouts, and you've got to get those numbers and uh, numbers play a huge role in that. Um, so I, I think that's why people who say, no, I want engagement. Well, engagement's great, but your fans are going to engage in a huge way with you, but you're trying to reach those last 10, 20% that are not fans, they might have a view, but you're trying to, to win them over and make them fans. So they're not engaging immediately. Um, they may not even have heard of your product or service. They might have heard of IBM, but they might have heard that, you know, IBM has a cloud platform for under $50,000. So it, it's those little tidbits that you're trying to get out and just reach people with, and you need numbers to do it. No, I, I love it. And, and, and Mark Meyer just said it and he said it perfectly. You know, how do we want the influencer to move the needle? And what I usually reply back to every single person is I simply say, oh, 
a little. Hey, uh, Joe, oh. your your microphone has some crazy feedback in there, Joe. Um, <laughs> but I actually, I always ask that same question. You guys hear me say it a lot here. What does success look like? If you're hiring me as an influencer, what the, is it word of mouth? Is it impressions? Is it convincing maybe existing customers or existing, you know, when we worked at Applebee's, Applebee's was, had a really interesting model is they wanted us to focus on people that hadn't been to Applebee's in the last two years. If you could educate them that the menu had changed, that was success. It wasn't clicks to a white paper. It wasn't clicks to our, our live stream. Yet the success metric for them was education. Educate your, your audience and if they, especially those that hadn't been to Applebee's in two years, that Applebee's menus had changed. So I think that it was an actually a, a very interesting one um, from a piece. No, I couldn't agree more. So Rachel, you want to throw a question two out there? I know we're kind of jumping, we jumped into it a little bit, but. Yeah, so question two is uh, directed at each of us as individual influencers. Um, what role does defining a niche focus play in your career success? And I will throw that to Jed, because I, I, I know Brian, um, we were talking earlier, but I'm curious, uh, Jed, how a niche focus has played into your career. So uh, I'll flip the coin then, because I was just talking about numbers and, and, and that the breadth of your scope counts, but for, for addressing a niche market, you need to stand out, right? You need to, uh, to stand out of all the noise that's around you. So you need to focus, you need to narrow narrow that scope of expertise so that you are qualified as an expert within that scope. And, and that's how you'll stand out by demonstrating expertise in that narrow area. Um, so in, in the way that you form that question in terms of defining a niche focus play, and, and particularly you mentioned in career success, is that right? Yeah. So we're talking about personal branding now as opposed to corporate branding, right? And and I think I've said it before on this very show, personal branding means that you demonstrate specific expertise in a specific area. And uh, and Brian does that by by showing that he can handle all the bats, right? So he just got through saying he is a uh, a generalist. But he demonstrates that by hosting podcasts, doing video, owning the video streaming area, by reaching across tech to, to new industries. And he demonstrates that expertise on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, for, for those of you out there who have specific skill sets, who might be an engineer or a creative or something like that, it's a little bit easier for you to demonstrate that because you can narrow your focus into that area where you're best at. Now, if you do have side areas that you also excel at or, or are interesting to you, that's great. But to stand out in the crowd, you need to demonstrate expertise in, in a single area uh, in order to, to truly have an effective personal brand. No, I, I agree. I love it, Jed. All right, Jed, we're going to let you bounce real quick. For some yeah, reason, I appreciate you're... you having me on. Good to yeah. see you guys. All right, cheers, my friend. So, uh, Rachel, what about you? What, what role do you feel niche plays and focus as an influencer? I think it's good to have a foundation. So I think it's hard to kind of come out the gate saying, I know everything about everything. I think it's good if you kind of position yourself like I am one of the few people who know everything about this specific topic and I can speak to it at great length. I think it's it's a great place to start your personal branding, as Jed mentioned, or, or just, you know, having a career focus. And I think from there you can springboard into whatever direction you want to take, whether you want to broaden your expertise to more of a thought leader. Um, that's your call, but I think, yeah, I would, for me, having a niche focus has been incredibly beneficial. So, no, and I think, you know, I can, if I had to look back and reverse engineer some of my success and some of my failure, it was the fact that I didn't have a niche and someone wasn't even sure how to hire me. Um, or what I what I was ultimately best at. Um, I think that's something to think about. Even you know, I don't I don't believe in someone can be a social media uh, influencer or really a social media thought leader as a whole, as in knowing every platform. I believe there is an ability to to have a, a great understanding. But like I think of a you know, there's some Facebook thought leaders and there's some Twitter thought leaders and there's some you know, for me, live streaming thought leadership is something that I'm 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 focusing and aligning my philosophy, my strategy, my business towards. And really, I, I still believe that's a niche, but I don't think I, when I think niche, I think of, you know, when I, my podcast is called Smack Talk, stands for social, <laughs> mobile analytics and cloud. 
uh, when I presented that in front of a podcasting um, group that was um, Lewis Howes and John Lee Dumas, and I told them that was going to be the name of them, they said it will fail immediately. There is no way anybody cares about those topics. You must switch to a niche, which allowed me to actually start at launch it the very next week because I like when someone says something will fail and challenges me. But um, that's kind of how I look at niches. But Phyllis, thanks so much for all the awesome comments in there. I'd love to hear your insights. Yeah, so niche is my thing right now. And uh, I, you know, Andrea Vall and I have this school where we train people to be social media managers. And this is a big question in our industry, in our world. And uh, when you look at niches, the way we're looking at them is there are three types. You have the niche by industry. So you can niche by real estate or food or beauty or whatever the industry is, or you can niche by platform. So only Facebook, only Twitter, only whatever, and or you can niche by skill. So there are some people that are very skilled at ads or they're very skilled at images or they're very skilled at video or whatever. So you can niche by those three types or you can make your own little, you know, formulas of of real estate, Facebook images. You know, and so um, but we have found that the people that are most successful and the happiest working as a social media manager is when they have a niche. Which, you know, I, and I, I couldn't agree more and that makes so much sense. And I think, you know, for me, I also think of it as um, long-term, short-term success and what, you know, success looks like, because I think without a niche, you're playing a very long game. And sometimes that game just continues to get longer and longer, the more stuff changes and the more the industry kind of grows. And we had a comment in here, you know, um, and I, I, Kevin VIP said, you know, how can you become an influencer when there's so much noise out there? You know, that is a continual problem. I can tell you more data, more noise is coming. We're, we're not going, we're not going to reach, we're not reaching a plateau of noise. The noise is escalating by every live streaming tool. And as much as I like to think of myself as a live streaming evangelist. Uh, there's a crap load of co bad content out there before. There's a crap load more of it thanks to live streaming and everybody feeling that they're their own broadcaster or have their own uh, thing to share. But I think I, I love your point of view where there is a, an element there where it has, if you do have a niche, you have the ability to be happier and have shorter term success metrics because you are focused and strategic and people know when they're buying you, they're knowing this is what you're accomplishing. And it's also it's also easiest if your niche isn't in the bleeding edge category. If you're in the bleeding edge category of a niche, that is dangerous because the niche might change, the bleeding edge might even fail or it might pivot away from everything you're doing. So I, I, I'm so glad you, you brought that up because I think that's really good. Yeah. Peace out, back to work. All right, thanks fellas so much. All right, hey Jennifer, I was just giving you awesome guys a shout out. How are you? You did, I appreciate it. I am great, thank you very much. Yeah, we are, uh, we actually have a new employee. So, you know, introducing him to Blab, showing him what it's all about. It's awesome. Great conversation. And particularly this question. So um, for those of you that have been on some of my other Blabs, you know, I'm an attorney by trade, but I work operations for a creative agency here in Raleigh. So this is something that for me personally, for my personal brand, it's like, where, where is my niche? If I tried to describe myself, you know, most lawyers are like, well, you're not in a courtroom. And then other people are like, but you're an attorney. Why are you working in house? Um, so I fall in this really weird place. So I, I've come to find that for me, my, my expertise, my career expertise is in employment relations, compliance, kind of that big picture, human capital, human resources. A lot of fun things go on in there and a lot of great things, a lot of great content out there. But me personally, I'm interested in the law. I'm interested in sports and I love craft beer. So I've found a way to like weave those into my, my personal brand, especially what I'm tweeting about. And I think it just makes you more real to people, you know, when, when you're not so business all the time. And uh, I think kind of based on maybe those interests and, and how I'm describing myself, those are certainly some niche industries and I would not declare myself uh, an expert on any one of them. So maybe I am kind of a generalist, but I know what I can talk about and I know where, you know, I have to ask the questions versus stating the facts. So I, but it takes a lot of time to think about those things. So I, I think it's a, certainly a good, maybe a personal reflection uh, here and there to, to start thinking about what am I putting out there? And of course, does it, is there a value to my audience? Really? Right. That's, that's the ultimate thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anything that you say, unless there's a value to the people that you're sending it to. Couldn't agree more. And I tell you what, um, the question that I 
answer differently every single day, every single time I'm asked is what the hell do you do? And that's a <laughs> downside of being a generalist, right? So I think that's actually something that actually helps that hurts, you know, hurts us in that space where someone that is niche focused says, I'm a badass at Instagram. I'm the Instagram expert. I help small businesses be great at Instagram. You're like, well, crap, I know what you do. You know, and then exactly. when, you know, when someone says, John Loomer says, I create training courses to help people do Facebook ads better. Bam, I know what you do. So I, Jennifer, I feel you. I'm right there with you. And <laughs> yes. uh, I also love craft beer and sports. And I'm so glad we connected because we've been, uh, we, we connected offline and online. So it's- uh, I know. So it sounds like we need to start a new generalist category then, the, the sports and beer generalist. I don't know. I, I like that. But I tell you what, here's a, one that kills me though. Being a generalist is looked down upon in higher ed still today with across the board. You don't have yep. a major. The reason I tell you to pick a major is they want you to have a niche. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. I mean, and um, let's be also honest. I changed my major five times because I don't have a niche. So right. uh, maybe that's telling you, maybe everyone who leaves college have to change their major so many damn times. That's like the, that's the, the, the launch board for becoming a generalist. But um, Jennifer, thanks so much for jumping in. Yeah. Thank you guys. Great question. I love all this. Uh, I love all this dialogue going on in the in the, in the uh, comments too. What say you, Jen? I would say to you, Rachel. Well, so there was a. I forget. I I pasted it into my comment section, so I wouldn't forget. So there's a comment thrown out asking, "Is it better to be a specialist in our industry or a general generalist?" Um, and we've kind of gone round around. I don't think either is better or worse, but I think even as a generalist, you need to have your elevator pitch down. So you need to know whether you use big words like I do, like social business strategist. And then, you know, if you talk to me for five minutes, it will drill down to, yeah, well, I focus on primarily influencer marketing. But as a whole, you know, it falls into that social business category. So um, but having that elevator pitch as a specialist or a generalist is super important. No, I agree. And actually, uh, Phil Phyllis said something I thought was pretty interesting. And she said she's always been stuck as a generalist yet she trains and works in niches. And I actually think that's an interesting approach. I will tell you that I'm doing the exact same approach. Um, you know, I specialize and know and love so many different things as a generalist, but yeah, I am focusing on honing down exactly what I can do to exactly a target um, deliverable because not only does it help with your elevator pitch, but when you have multiple ones of those, it then exactly shows how good of a generalist you are. I think without, I think being a generalist, um, don't confuse being a generalist for being a thought leader in everything, because I don't think that's, I don't think that's possible. Um, I think uh, I love Gary Vaynerchuk's quote. You know, he says when the, when the 25 year old or 22 year old kid out of college comes up to him and asks him, um, Hey, how do I become a thought leader? And he says, go fucking do something. Um, and it's pretty, pretty simple. And um, yet it's probably true. And so many millennials, I think, look at somebody on stage and say, I know what they know and, and don't value their experience or their knowledge or their expertise. And they forget that you do have to actually do something to actually, and there is no such thing as overnight success. So I want to pose this third question. Are we doing a third question or a fourth question, Rach? I was uh, going to skip to four because I think we kind of answered number three, yep. but number four, I'm curious to hear what the community says. So which pers persona, the we have the expert, the amplifier, and the thought leader, should businesses target first for their influencer marketing efforts? So Rachel, I know you and I actually debated this question earlier and, oh man, hey, uh, Kristen Cardos, I just threw that topic out there under my name, but the topic thing is still not working on Blab. So if you could copy and put that in as a topic, that would rock. Um, but um, this is actually really interesting because I think from a small business to a medium-sized business, to an enterprise, to even an entrepreneur, I think you should have an influencer marketing strategy. doesn't mean you have to spend money on it, but I think you should, if you are not looking at influencer marketing as understanding what, who's influencing your customers, your clients, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. But understanding where to start is a great question. So Rachel, what are, what's your thoughts on where they should actually start when it comes to influencer marketing? So... Actually, I was thinking about my answer that I when we were talking earlier. And it's not that I've changed my answer, but it really does at the end of the day come down to the individual business goals. But for me, um, I usually start with the amplifiers because they're the easiest to spot. Um, you, you can do you know quick hashtag searches and find people who are talking the loudest about you know your areas of in and around the conversations you know that you want to be a part of. Um, and that's where I start. And hooking in with an amplifier can also help you attract experts and thought leaders because um, they'll see that your brand is now attached to these conversations. Um, so while that method may 
change in order depending on what your long-term goals are. I think that's a pretty general good first step. Yeah, and I, and I think something to remember here when we're talking about these personas, someone can actually be two of these personas or they could be two of these personas at a different niche, a different focus or for a different brand, right? You can have someone that is an, an expert in one space or an expert in one small area, but yet a social amplifier in a, in a larger area. But I, I love that, you're, that you said, um, you know, social amplifier, because until you said that, I really was like, Interesting, because I kind of look at it and said, you know, I always use the same line. It's the same line I use all the time is you start with the community. But what the hell does that mean? Because we're talking about actions here, not fluffy crap you can say on stage. So I'm actually meaning what I mean by starting with the community is who are the who are the your target audience listening to today? Are they actually listening to the 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 the, the experts and the thought leaders? Or maybe you don't know who they're listening to. If you don't know the ampli- the social amplifier is the key, it's the gold because they're going to allow you to spray out there all that message and then really listen, right? As the chief listener, I know Rachel agrees with that. As as a, uh, you're going to listen to what all these people are responding to them, and I can tell you, a social amplifier, and we didn't bring this up earlier, a social amplifier that actually might be polarizing or um, cause a little bit of controversy. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing because I think there's also an element of how do you spark enough conversation and enough uh, dialogue to understand what the hell your community does want and who they're listening to. Oftentimes is you got to get them fired up or you have to poke the bear um, like they like to say. So I think that's an interesting one. I'm seeing some very interesting comments come up on, on Twitter, just kind of back and forth. And I, I think, you know, our friends at tracker are in the, the Twitter feed and I will tell you guys the, the, the CEO of tracker uh, Pierre is one of our favorite guests. How many times do we have on the show? Three times on the show in two years. At probably? least three. Yeah. At least three. And I will tell you, um, tracker not only rocks, but um, Pierre, when it comes to uh, thought leadership and influencer marketing, he's not a social amplifier, small social footprint. He is an expert, but he is also a thought leader. He is a resource. I will say that I probably have three resources when it comes to um, who I go to for influencer marketing trends and understanding and all of that side of the play space. And I love seeing Tracker out there. So big shout out to, to Tracker um, in the um, in the Twitter sphere. But I, yeah, I, I for me, understanding where you're starting your marketing efforts. And also remember, influencer marketing, um, as much as I hate it as an influencer, which is usually the free model, um, swag, you know, a little bit, little periscope hearts that I have here. I can, I can drop some periscope hearts in here. Um, swag actually goes a long way, especially if you're a startup, when you're reaching out to influencers, access to events, access to products, access to prototypes. I currently have seven apps that I'm beta testing on my phone, none of which are paying me, which is probably part of my business model problem and my elevator pitch problem. But the truth is these are all startups. These are all apps that have no budget, but they kind of got after me and said, hey, you can help shape this product. You can help us build a product around this. We're gonna give you exclusive access. And if we're as we're building something great, if you believe in it, you'll help us grow it and we'll be able to reward you down the road. They, they hook, lined, and sinkered me on seven different occasions. And I think that's something that a lot of brands kind of look at influencer marketing still today and says, I can't afford Beyonce. I can't afford someone that has 100,000 followers or many followers as Stephen Caggiano, who's in our, in our room right now. And I would actually challenge you that says, that's not really true. Listen to your influencer and find out what they care about, what they matter most. I had someone just recently send me an email and said they would donate $5,000 to Team No Kid Hungry if I would write a blog post for their website. Guess what I said in immediately? And I'm really bad at answering emails. I answer that email in about 30 seconds with a hell yes, when do you want the blog post? Because they know I care about Team No Kid Hungry and that they by them doing that was something that I would uh, kind of focus on. So um, that's just kind of my little soapbox there because I think I love, I, I really hope everyone who's listening to this, everybody who's engaging on Twitter looks at influencer marketing and says it can work for them. Because if you understand these personas, I'm so glad that Rachel kind of defined these personas and kind of built the, this conversation today. Because I think this is a conversation more brands need to have. So we had a quick question. Um, someone who came a little later into the show is asking like, how are we quantifying influence by amplifier, expert, and thought leadership. Um, so we can kind of, I know we didn't throw out like, quali- you know, metrics. Per se, but for an amplifier, it's kind of a no brainer. It's based on the size of your social footprint. Uh oh, do we? 
produce the content around your expertise. So when I'm sourcing. Oh, we lost you, Rachel. Refresh real quick. I won't go anywhere. Yeah, you're, it, it hung up for a second there. I see that. I heard earlier they are having some issues on Blab. Um, so uh, how do you ask a question? If you use slash Q and then you put the question right afterwards, um, that's actually how you had a question in the comment section on Blab. I will tell you, if, I, if I'm mentoring everybody out there, and this is a free mentor Brian Fanzo coaching session, I would tell you, and Rachel I know would agree, and that's why I was kind of jumping in there, is that I will tell you, and I know Rachel would agree, is don't seek to become a thought, uh, don't seek to become a influencer. Seek to become an expert or a thought leader and understand what that means to get there. But becoming just an influencer, I think, is a is a short-sighted goal. And I think influence is so relative to your community and to the brands that's that talk to you that it is freaking hard. And I will uh, speak from that as someone that really worked hard at at doing kind of those things is, um, you know, it's not, it's not easy. And remember being influential means that the community trusts you and trust is hard to gain, but Rachel, go ahead on, on. Cause I, I, I kind of love that you were kind of caveating that before we went into blab free zone. Yeah. Where did uh, technology shut me down in the middle of my knowledge bomb there? <laughs> I know. I was like, damn, I was, it was going, no. So I, I think you were just getting into um, the kind of, uh Oh, I think you froze again. Oh, Oh, I think Rachel froze again. Ugh. So, um, yeah, the super moon or the blood moon is uh, is screwing with our internet connection here. So actually a great person, um, yes, I said with great influence comes great power. With great power comes great responsibility. With great responsibility comes a whole lot of uh, smart decisions that you must make when you are an influencer. I will tell you that I've um, I've worked really hard at that. The example I used on stage, which is really, really true, is that um, you know I had a, a skinny jean company that wanted to represent me on Periscope. Not only do I not show my legs, but skinny jeans are not my style. I did not uh, kind of turn that on. So Rachel, um, I think you froze near the beginning of your knowledge bomb. So you're back now. So, um, But apparently a bunch of people are saying all kinds of social networks are having um, – issues today. So we're going to blame it on the blood moon. I think uh, Blab just prefers me in mannequin mode. So <laughs> <laughs> do you want to recap real quick before I freeze again? We can move to the next question. <laughs> no. So I, I, I think I'm curious, Rachel, from your standpoint, I think what I, something that someone brought up over there is the idea of someone becoming a um, Blab, Brittany, I just said, blame it on the blood moon. No problem, Brittany. Yeah. For some reason, my topic change wasn't working. I blame that on the blood moon as well. Um, but Rachel, you know, from your, your job, you know, you work, you're a social listen, social listener, you work with brands on finding the right influencers for the right brands, for the right product, for the right mission, for, to achieve the right ob- objective. And if anybody understands what I just said there, it's freaking hard. And it's a skill that is uh, extremely difficult to find. If you're looking for an expert, I have one that's right here that co hosts with me every single Monday. I can give you her email address if you would like um, because she does not promote herself um, as well as I can because I've been working with her for a long time. But um, I, I would love to hear what your thoughts are there, Rachel, on this idea of someone, if you, we have our influencers listening right now and our brands listening, what, 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 what should they be achieving? What's their, what should they be uh, doing or working towards in, in this space to kind of get noticed? As an influencer, as what a brand should do? Uh, I, I think as an influencer. It was as an influencer. Well, for me, and even I know Brian Kramer touched on this at the beginning of the month, like starting out as an expert, expert, like, you know, very a niche focus is a good thing because uh, people like me and brands will source you and help you grow your influence and kind of you can piggyback off their existing amplification. And IBM is a good example of that. So if IBM will search for these experts, these people who are incredibly smart and knowledgeable in their field, but they're not known in the general industry particularly well, but they'll use their amplification engine and kind of coach you into being an influencer. Um, And I'm a product product of that. That a brand can offer. So everyone that looks at, looks at my relationship with IBM, they would assume that I had 40,000 followers. I can tell you, I had 1,100 followers. I was working at a data center company when IBM plucked me out of obscurity and kind of brought me in as an influencer in the cloud computing space. So if that's not a great example of, we talk about finding those that are the, the diamonds in the rough, and I won't clarify myself as one of those, but I will say, what I will say is that um, 
I was not socially, fo I, I had a personal brand and I was visible enough for, for them to find me and know what I was really good at, which was cloud computing and employee advocacy. But I was not an amplifier in the social sense when IBM plucked me out three years ago. So uh, I mean, to your example, Rachel, as you were saying that, I'm laughing because I'm like, that was me. That was me. I remember the day but that they met. it's also the they, easiest they, place to start to grow your influence. Like, play to your strengths. Like, that's a, just an absolute no-brainer in my mind. Like, go with what you're best at. Create your niche. Create a reason, your value point. Like, why are people going to listen to me? And then go from there. Because once you start, you know, you're the expert on this thing, you're going to stand out in the crowd. Um, cause you want, you know, ultimately you want to be what they say, you want to be the voice, not the echo. That's definitely the difference between a generalist and a specialist as a specialist. You can be that voice that stands out from the noise. Um, yeah, and, and I saw, um, will grow from there. I saw Gerald who was just trying to get on here. He said, what dictates an influencer versus an amplifier? And that's actually a great question. And we're going to clarify it very simply as an amplifier is an influencer there. Yes. We, we have three personas of an influencer. That is something that confused me when I was going through this process, but these are all influence. A thought leader is an influencer. A, a expert is an influencer and an amplifier is an influencer. They're all different personas that achieve different goals for their brands, as well as have different uh, skill sets for each one of those personas. The problem has been we, we lump an influencer in, in it kind of, we, we broadly stroke it without identifying the need for different types. And I will let Rachel kind of explain the need for all three, because I slightly disagreed up until 2015 on the need for one of these type of amplifier, uh, these, uh, I just gave it away, uh, one of these type of uh, influencers, but I've been proven wrong. So Rachel, I mean, can you get in? Cause I think that's kind of, will help clarify that for some of the people that are, we're jumping in here, but, um, and, and there is a difference between, I would say a fan um, and a, or an advocate. I like to call myself an evangelist, but an advocate or a fan than an influencer as well. Right. Yeah, but again, there it's all everybody has influence. Like I think we're we're definitely in a, in agreement on that. Like everybody, your grandma, my grandma, my neighbor, everybody has influence on some level. And if we chose three personas today because you know you could have ten if you really wanted to get you know super finite. You could go down to advocates and fans and what do those mean and how do they play into your influencer marketing strategy. Um, but three keeps it much simpler in my mind. Um, and again amplifiers the name kind of is the, what we called it you know they're out there they're going to amplify your message on social media um your expert is your, your niche subject matter expert they can talk very um focused on certain topics your product or service and your thought leader is somebody who's well versed in the, your industry as a whole and they're really important to tap into so you have your finger on the pulse of what's affecting change today and in the future um, and experts tend to be more hyper focused on today, while a thought leader really focuses on what's going to happen later and then helps shape the future of the industry. Um, and each incredibly influential in their own right. And I think it's also extremely important to understand that ultimately, if a brand does this correctly, they use all three and make the decision process when their, their community and customer then is making a decision and, and taking an action because of all three. Yes, it can happen with one or the other. If you do great social amplification, all of a sudden someone finds out about a product that they knew nothing about, they educate themselves, and all of a sudden they buy the product. That's possible, a lot harder. But if you're able to, to educate them, connect them with an, uh, an expert, and then hear about it from a thought leader, they're going to make the decision on a much more reliable basis. So I think that's something to kind of think about there on that idea where I actually think, think true influencer marketing should involve all three of these roles. And I didn't used to think that. Um, I used to think that you could just take an expert um, and you could really kind of the experts, the trusted resource. Why would the expert not work? Well, if nobody knows who's who the hell the expert is, then how the heck are they going to influence anybody to make a decision? And that's why you need the amplifier. And if the amplifier is amplifying an expert, how do you know about educating people on making, driving a larger ind industry change unless you have that thought leader? I think there's definitely a point for each. I will tell you, um, as someone that kind of is looked at as an expert in certain areas, people don't look at me as an expert and then care about my social amplification. And once they find out that I'm an expert, they kind of like, I want to ping you for your expertise. When they find out it's a, a social amplification, it's a byproduct. But um, what's up, Lindsay Evans? If you guys were following me on hey. Twitter, I got to hang out with the awesome Ohio Social Mom in NYC. How are you, Lindsay? I am recovered. I am feeling much better. Um, but so it's interesting. I really, Kristen's like, jump in. I said, I don't have anything to offer. But um, I actually got invited to go to 
Ted Rubin's Brand Innovators Conference. Um, and the really the only talk I got to jump in on was uh, the CEO of Stowaway Cosmetics. And aside from the fact that I now love her product because she dropped more F-bombs than I'd ever heard anyone that ever gave a speech say. Um, oh, that's wonderful, LinkedIn. That's great. Um, so... But she was, they had a little panel, like a fireside chat panel, and they specifically, you know, it's all, um, it's all people that are talking about influencers and how you get people to, it was like from, from Instagram to pro athletes, how you can get influencers to give out your product or whatever. And so you had Cadillac who gives people cars and then you have, uh, you know, Stowaway Cosmetics who she's like a startup who has like an angel investor and is just trying to get people to buy her mascara. And so it was really interesting for Cadillac to say, well, we only like to work with people who have X amount of followers and they have to be this famous and they have to be on the A-list and we give them cars. And what we found was we're giving, you know, say we give, um, you know, a pro football player a Cadillac for a week and then they drive it around. Well, then the next week they get a car from somebody else and they drive that car around. So it's really doing them no good to give these humongous, you know, influencers, I guess, or whatever you would call them, uh, a car because they get cars all the time. But they said, you know, what we found better was that if we had a test drive event and we had a 72 hour test drive event and we gave it to, you know, the moms or the people that are in the communities driving these, and then people can see them, they are much more likely to influence their friends and neighbors that say, man, that is a nice Cadillac that I've never seen before. And I was going to go between a Cadillac and this other comparable car and really giving it to the celebrities didn't really do them a lot of good in selling cars because celebrities get given cars all the time. Not yeah, I think amazing. attacking, attacking is probably the wrong word, selecting celebrities for your influencer campaign was kind of the first generation. And I think we're I think we're even past the second generation now where influencer choice is much more strategic and thoughtful. And it really, you know, brands and, you know, people building out strategy take the time to find those moms, and those people who are actually going to drive action. Because at the end of the day, like awareness is one thing, but if you're not driving decisions and actually like purchasing decisions. Yeah, yeah. that's, and that's exactly what I told um, the girl from the cosmetics line. I said, uh, you know, I'm just a nobody. I'm not like from a company in this room. I just got invited here. And I just want to tell you that it was really refreshing how you were talking that you don't really give a crap. Well, I mean, she said other words, but she's like, I don't really care who is repping like our cosmetics. Firstly, I feel like they should all be paid. I'm not going to give anybody just free makeup to rep my makeup line. Like that's ridiculous. I feel like you should get paid for your time, whether you're an influencer, a celebrity, a person, a blogger, whatever, like I'm gonna pay you. And she said, so if you're not paying somebody for their time, you're basically telling them that, you know, their time's worth crap unless they volunteer to do like a beta, like you said, Brian. But um, I went up and talked to her and said, you know, I'm a mom, I keep my makeup in my car. Like her, her deal is that all the makeup fits in like the palm of your hand. It's this big, you can put it in a bag. And I said, that's me, like you, I am your audience right here, not the people that care about ginormous bags of makeup and have all the makeup on their face. I, like, I have no makeup on right now. I said, I do my makeup on my way to wherever I'm going, and it's always in my car and my console. So you just hit me with saying that I make whatever it is just as nice as everyone else. It's just smaller, and you can take it with you. So, And she's like, thank you so much. Like That's really good feedback for me. I mean, not that you're a nobody, which I am, but you know, it was all these people in the room that are marketing people and then me. So. I love I love hearing that too because I think brands that understand that are, are the ones that are changing the game. And for those that are watching this and knowing this, you know, we do social business hour every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we're going to stick around for a little bit longer as long as uh, we kind of drive this conversation. I think the conversation is bigger than one hour. We've been having it all month, but I love the dialogue here. So let's stick around and do it a little bit. Also, want to give a shout out to SAP Small Business. SAP Small Business. I work with them. They sponsor one of my shows, but they've been in the Twitter feed um, all day today. So as a as an influencer, someone that supports that. I think brands that understand and get it are also participating in the community, not having to own the community, but actually being part of the community. And that's really what this is kind of all about. So a uh, shout out to them. Um, I actually think there's a good question in here, uh, Rachel, that I wanted to kind of pull back to you. And really it comes down to, you know, I was laughing because I used to say I had to defend my clout score. And for me, I think clout score is one variable. It's not, uh, it's not the only sole variable you should use. But if, there, if you're looking for social amplification, 
where do you suggest someone looks? Is it just monitoring a hashtag and seeing who shares that hashtag with the largest following? Um, Because that's actually a great question because I think social amplification is only great if they're actually amplifying stuff that that audience is actually semi-relative to, correct? Yes, I mean, there's amplification for amplification's sake, like just driving impressions on a hashtag. um, It's debatable how relevant relevancy to the cause is. Um, and in that regard, clout doesn't play much of a role. Um, as, as we know, like, actually, my clout score has dropped significantly. It's my lack of love for Instagram. But there was a time when I only had 5,000 followers, but I was at a clout score of 80. So it's, there's no way a brand would look at me and say that I was an amplifier because my network was relatively teeny compared to a lot of other people. Um, so when I'm sourcing amplifiers, it really has a lot to do with the size of their social footprint collectively. So, you know, you've got X amount on Twitter, X amount on Google Plus, Facebook. Like, what can we give you and how far is it going to spread as quickly as possible? You know, and if you look at Cloud Score, for example, here, and I have mine up, and I think one that's a good example is it says I am a expert, and it's on my Cloud Score, in blogging. Um, if you were uh, looking for someone that's looking for an expert in blogging and you targeted this guy, you have missed the mark. So that's a good example of someone that looks at cloud without looking at other variables and you're going to go, Hey, this guy's an expert blogger. We're going to send him a blogging tool and he's going to, all these people are going to care. And they're going to go, wait a second. We help him self edit and adjust his stuff when he has all typos and grammatical stuff. Wait, how is he the expert in, in, in cloud? So for those that I, I, I love to poke fun because I I'm one that's been, um, been lucky and thankful for some of the things that come along with that, but I've also, um, and so, and, and Lindsay, I, I remember, you know, you were at Periscope summit and, uh, you know, Periscope Summit I thought was really interesting because everybody came from different walks of life. And I can tell you, as influential and as many followers as someone people think they had there in that crowd, there was a crap load of people that had never heard of me, seen me, or heard me on Periscope before. A crap load of them. So if someone was uh, and it was influencer marketing and, and, tar- and leveraged me to go at that audience, I would tell you, I've been working really hard on live streaming for six months, really freaking hard. I missed 40% of an audience that was at the Periscope Summit that never heard of me. And it's because they are so niche focused that it doesn't, they, they would never tune into a personal branding scope when they do, they do uh, artwork or they do life coaching or they do, you know, things that just don't cross over. So I think understanding that is also something that we all kind of have to understand when it comes to influencer marketing and really what it all means kind of coming down, down the pipe. So I want to, I'm curious, this last question I want to send out there and Lindsay, you can stay on for the ride. If anybody else wants to jump in there, feel free to do so. Um, in the fight to stay relative and competitive, what's next for marketing? I have my own thoughts, but I would love to hear your two lovely ladies thoughts. Um, it's a, I love these questions, but I don't know if I have a definitive answer to this one. Um, I think we're really just scratching the surface of what influencer marketing can do and be. So I think, um, I'm really excited to ride the wave and see what's going to happen next and the tools that will come out to help, um, you know, allow us to craft and amplify our messages better. Um, I think it's, 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 we're kind of coming back. It's, we're just going full circle. It's all about word of mouth again. Um, and even though we're on social and our mouths get heard by more people, it's still peer to peer, you know, one to one type of scenarios that work best. So it's kind of working out how to do that better. Cause right now we're still lacking a little bit of that human touch a lot of the time. So, um, I agree. I agree. Volar, how are you, my friend? Okay. How are you? I'm uh, wonderful. What say you? Well, I know that we've gone to one to one in that direction, but at the same time, I remember reading the uh, book, uh, the, the New Rules for the New Economy, and it posed the, the possibility in that book, which is free online, if anyone wants to read it, The New Rules for the New Economy, that's Kevin Kelly. It posed the, the, the prospect that we also go in the other direction. Like we've had media that maybe is national, but an international media might be. The way to go as well, more ma- even super mass marketing rather than one to one as well as the direction. It's not saying that this is invalid, but suppose someone came up with a way of um, removing the United States national debt, and by doing that, affected the entire world's economy. 
because every single one of the people in the United States right now have the national debt over their head unconsciously, whether they realize it or not. It's an example for us what's happening with our government. And if somehow that could be wiped out and the government was in a positive direction rather than uh, a debt direction, how would everyone's psychology, how would everyone's feeling be different? And that's all. That was my thought. I love it. And I, and I love that. I love that way of thinking also, because I think it also comes down into, you know, when you're making decisions on purchases or decisions on life, are you looking at, are you making the decision with as open eyes and understanding all sides of the story, or are you sheltered or shaped in what you're asking or looking at based on your current financial situation, your current role, your current, you know, your impacts in your culture. I think there's so many variables that sometimes people forget that ultimately make the decision for you. Like, honestly, if you're attracting people that are in the poverty level and you're doing a smartphone campaign, they probably don't have a smartphone. Therefore, you're you're kind of, you know, not looking at it the correct way. So I, I love that um, insights. Thanks so much for jumping in, my friend. Have a nice day. Thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to drop my little thoughts here and um, on um, what I believe the future of marketing is and really how um, the next for marketing. And I believe it's about social good. I believe the future of marketing is actually aligning what we do as a business with what we can do for the greater good. And I firmly believe the reason I spend more money at Chipotle than other places, other than the fact that I love it, is that they do have a, a greater good campaign. The reason I love Tom's and I talk about them all the time is they have a greater good campaign. I believe marketing is less about now going to be about, hey, 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 buy the shit I like or buy the shit I'm selling you. And it's be more about, hey, the money that you're investing with us because you trust us and you like our products, we are also investing in you, the community, by investing in social good. So that's kind of my rant on that. And I will tell you, on that note of social good, I want to, I want to jump into our, our guest who jumped in here. My friend Jed, our friend Jed Record jumped in here and dropped a tweet out earlier about online bullying. And I can tell you, I was brought to tears in the audience um, at uh, Periscope Summit this past week because I heard about what happens in female scopes. Um, I'm going to put the link right here in the um, in the in the comments. You guys see that link? If you could do me a favor, I'm going to test my influence. Just kidding. I'm going to test it, you guys. I'm going I'm to lean on you guys. If you could just retweet, click on that tweet, retweet it. And really, it's the idea is don't be silent. Online bullying is not a victimless crime. We need to step up and take action, report online bullies to network support and staff. Um, thank you, Jed, for actually putting that out there as a tweet. I will retweet it. Hopefully, you guys will retweet it as well. I believe that's an element of social good, and I also believe that community can make a difference with that. So um, is it Jamaro? Jam Oreo. Jam Oreo. I completely butchered that, but that's about 100% of what I do for all the guests on here. So um, how are you, my friend? What say you? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. I hope you're doing well too. This is my second lab with you and my first question joining in. So I hope it goes well. Um, my question is, as you mentioned, finding your niche and try to follow, follow those who are within your niche or even someone like you who is a generalist that can be a big influence through the Twitter world. So my question is, how do you avoid those people such as yourself that have a big influence or amplification on Twitter and follow you, how do you avoid losing those as followers? Is there certain things that you avoid saying or certain things that you don't do? Maybe following those accounts that are BS accounts or maybe those accounts that are fake. How do you avoid losing those great influencers that are following you as you're new to the Twitter world as a entrepreneur? Love that question. And the fact that you're the fact that you're asking that question question already knows that you're a step above the, the kind of the rest. Um, I believe in a, in a simple method that every digital action that you take is a way that you tell your story. Therefore, everything you share, everything you retweet, everything you engage, every person you follow ultimately looks back at you. So I believe that it's not about hating on other people or breaking other people down to make yourself look good. Too many people already do that on social media. Those are the people that I block and unfollow. The people that get it are not only listening and learning, but they're sharing those that they have actually taught them. And my social philosophy is pretty simple, show you care. And I don't believe that you should always do everything that we all should do. And I can tell you, I listen to Jay Bear, um, Jay Bear, Ted Rubin, um, Jay, uh, Jay Bear, Ted Rubin, and Gary Vaynerchuk. But what I did was I listened and learned from them. 
And then I found out how to, I could implement little aspects of myself in there because the only way you stand out from the noise is you have to be yourself because there is only one of you. So my recommendation is share content, share things. Every digital action matters, but ultimately do a quote tweet, share things and add your own insights because people are following you for you. They're not following you for an RSS feed or an auto retweet of everybody else. And ultimately that's where people get frustrated and they say, I can't stand out from the noise. And says, I have no idea what you ever have to say because all you do is share everybody else's content. Or you have the other side of the extreme that says, you apparently think you're perfect and know everything because you've never shared anybody else's content. So I believe it's, it's kind of that, that area about share stuff that inspires and you think can help your community. But um, I believe in it. And the reason I believe in it is I've proved it to be true. And it's allowed me to get where I'm at today by taking that simple philosophy. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. No problem. Cheers, yes. my friend. All right. Man, I got fired up. I love this topic today, guys. This is a, this is some awesome discussion. This is um I tell you what, if we can change the way that influencer marketing is looked at and we start reaching out to the people that actually can inspire, motivate and make a difference in their community and we understand that you need experts, you need amplifiers and you need thought leaders. Um I think this world's going to be a better place. And Rachel, I'm curious from your point of view. What's your thoughts on lists here as we're kind of wrapping up this last part? There's so many people that get butt hurt because they're not on a list yet. They've never done the criteria or they've never even thought enough to like figure out what the list was built on. Now, granted, we all know that um, some people just go, my favorite 25 people that I followed. Well, guess what? If you're not in that list, you're just not their favorite. Get over it. But I'm curious. Um, hey, Victoria, look at this. It's like a, a Periscope reunion. I can tell you guys, these two ladies here are smarter, more beautiful, and, and awesome just offline as they are online, as I've been lucky to, to see that. But Rachel, what are your thoughts on lists? And then I'll, I'll, we'll kind of bring Victoria in to see what she has to say. But I would love to hear your thoughts on that because I think it's kind of ridiculous that you. The, uh, we have a friend of the show, my friend Daniel Newman. He always said everybody hates all the lists except for the ones they're on. It's true. Um, and I think before people get their panties in a twist about not making it onto a list, um, I always take the time to go through and read the full report, depending on there's, you know, there's the hand curated list and then there's like the, you know, tool curated. And for the tool created list, always take the time to go through and see how it was generated um, because it makes it really black and white when you read the fine print. Um, it's like, well, you didn't make the list because of X, Y, Z. And if you want to be on the list next time, you just need to do X, Y, Z. And there you go. Um, the hand curated lists are my favorite because um, I like to know who is generally influencing other people. So I take a, a lot of interest in those. Um, but the industry lists, it's those for the most part have a lot to do with uh, being an amplifier. If we really want to break it down, um, a lot of them, it's based on the conversations that you're having online with certain people. So if you're tweeting a lot, chances are you're going to make those lists more likely than somebody who is not. So um, I don't think lists are bad. Um, I personally don't care if I make a list or not, <laughs> but um, they, they do serve a purpose in a way. They're very validating in some regards. Um, and for certain career paths, they are very important. So I think if you are somebody who is Amy going down a certain road and you need to make it onto a list, then you need to do the work to get on the list because it's not going to happen without some hard hustle. And they no, spell I, it out for you for the most part. I love that. But I can tell you for those that are listening, you know, I love the idea of understanding what the list are and understanding if that list even matters to you. Um, I will tell you one list that I got and I always say it's an award, but it was kind of a list was I did have an, a list early on in my career when IBM kind of plucked me out and it changed my life. It changed my career. It got me recognized. It got me on a, on a platform that I would have, it would have taken me another year and a half to be on. But I can also tell you, not only did I not know they were doing that list is I had no idea what that list was about. And um, that was something that for me, I think kind of put things in perspective. So um, my, my friend, Chris Brogan always told me, unless your clout score is leading to your bottom line, or the list is allowing you to do things better in business and in life. Don't get butt hurt about a list you're not on because it's not making, not getting you any further. So um, I love that you kind of talked about that. But you know, for me, the the list was actually, and that's great. I'm so glad Jenna Fouts actually put on that. You got on the list through your connections, right? And I and I actually got on that list, the one that I got plucked out of obscurity from. Um, actually, I got on that because of a client that I pitched, and the client that I pitched. Um, was very lucky enough for me and said, I'm not going to buy your product, but I would love to interview you and let my community know what you are doing. 
And uh, his name is uh, Vidar. If you guys know Vidar, um, Vidar is the CEO of Metalit. Um, Metalit was a company that was working with my company and was working at the company I was working at. Um, he loved what I was doing when I was about and all the headway that I was making, but unfortunately he couldn't even get his tool implemented. Um, but because he actually saw something in me and took the time, um, and I'm forever grateful for him, um, he kind of let, amplified my message to the world, the right people, the economist and IBM found out about it. They gave me an award, brought me out to events. Um, and that was a little bit because of connections, but it was also because uh, I'm not shy of talking or selling my story. But we all know that. That's not a surprise. But how are you, Victoria? I'm very well, thank you. How are you guys? You well? Doing splendid. So what do, what do you think about this whole this whole conversation and topic? Um, I love this conversation and for me I'm kind of coming at it from a, a same sort of point as Lindsay. Um, so for my degree I, um, I wrote a um, sort of like my study on celebrity and the role of celebrity in society and I think for me it's massively changed whereas before when I was perhaps younger I would look at celebrity as a key influencer to the products I bought etc etc etc. Now I think it's got to the point where a lot of celebrities in general almost don't have that credibility with me anymore and it might it might just be my thinking I don't know but I think they sort of think it's almost like they're God-given right that they are they're in that position and that people will automatically buy so they don't engage on social media like other people do um, you know they often sit there they tweet their own things they don't share other people's things it's almost like they're you know, a cut above the rest, which means that we can no longer resonate with who they are or their values. So it's just that these people that are telling us to buy a product. And I just think, well, now I just kind of think, well, why? Because I don't resonate with you. I don't know what your beliefs are. There's nothing that you're saying that flicks my switch. Um, you know, you, you just stand there a cut above the rest. And I think like, I think as well, almost like celebrities make it hard to um, accept the everyday life as it is because they don't have that everyday life that we have so it's kind of like I just kind of think I'll stick your celebrity up your bum really um because it doesn't influence me so yeah that's that's my thoughts really um yeah for me it's like resonating with people that are normal human nice people that have good values yeah, you know, and I think that you know I love that Victoria, and I think that's also kind of comes into this trust factor, right? Because I think yeah. I mean, not only the trust, but you know, um, I that quote's really important to me. But you know, I actually I think this is why I love the personas because I don't think you know because uh, Jenna Fouch you put in there does the, the size of your network relate to your influence? If 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 you're a, a social amplifier, if that's the role you have as an influencer, hell yes, it, the size matters. But if you're an expert, no, the size of your network doesn't matter. Your expertise matters. If you're a thought leader, it's your ability to understand who the influencers are, who the experts are, connect the dots, and also the knowledge that you have yourself. So I would even question where the network fits in there. I think you have to have a network to become a thought leader because you have to be able to connect with the influencers. But I don't believe the size of your network relates to your direct influence unless you are a social amplifier. That's why I love that we categorize this because before it was always, well, you know, size matters. And I can tell you, I had a brand in the last month tell me they would double my pay if I doubled, if my follower account was at 100,000. Um, and because that goes against everything that I believe in with what I'm trying to build, then I would not. But if I was only seeking amplification roles with brands, hell yes, I would work really hard. Now, I wouldn't pay for followers, but I would strategically use Manage Flitter or Just Unfollow or um, Tweepy or all these. Uh, there's so many great tools out there that allow you to strategically follow first. But I, And I would do that if that was my, my goal. My goal now went from always being an expert in something to being a thought leader in a, in a, in a new emerging space. And to do so, not only have to merge myself in there, but Total number of followers and size of my network does not matter if I don't know who influences who, what the products are, who are the experts, and ultimately, if I don't know who these social amplifiers are. Okay, let's be real. Yeah. For me as a thought leader, I send lots of people like Stephen Caggiano and Ted Rubin and Ray Wang and say, hey guys, I'm working with this great group that I believe is doing amazing things called No Kid Hungry. Any chance you could spare a tweet? And in that case, they're my social amplifiers and they allow me to, to establish thought leadership through the fact that I'm connected with many influencers that are social amplifiers as well as experts. Does that make sense to everybody there? I love that. I, I, and I think, I tell you what, I give all the credit to Rachel because she messaged me last week about this topic. Um, it's not something that I, um, I, I thought we would kind of severely disagree. Um, the more I kind of took an open mind, I can tell you the Periscope Summit opened my eyes um, because there are some really influential people there that are influential in a different role than I am. 
and I now understand what they are. They are influ they are influencers in Periscope, but they are influencers in the sense that they are amplifiers. They are not thought leaders and they are not experts and we need them and I need them because I can't get my message out as a, as someone that is seeking to become a thought leader in an emerging space. But I believe the space is too young to become a thought leader today. But I actually think now that it makes more sense to me that I have to have aligned with the experts, but I also have to, I know who those amplifiers are in that space so that when I need Alex Khan to share something out or the fact that Amanda Oleander trusts me as a resource now, or the fact that I have these people that have these ginormous followings can make a damn difference. And um, I think that's ultimately what I've learned and I love this conversation. So I think there's a couple more questions. Uh, Brian McFarland uh, says, what are your thoughts about establishing yourself as a leader that can be trusted? Well, for me, and I say it a lot, it's body of work. Um, you have to be able to back up with what you're saying with work you've actually done. I mean, I'm all for, I'm an avid reader. I think you need to read the lead. If I ever have a, a catchphrase, that's going to be one of them. Um, so you need to do your homework, do your research, but nothing compares to having your own body of work on a specific topic. So you can talk to it as somebody who is in there daily doing it. So to become a, a thought leader, start as an expert, and then you expand your knowledge by networking with other peers and other experts. Um, and it's all just about growing your knowledge. And then when you, you know enough, you can start making uh, predictions and then you become a thought leader and shaping the choices that other people make. And yeah, and I love Mark Meyer. Mark Meyer said, oh, trust, right? Because I think that's, you know, I, I talk a lot, about a lot from like a, how you lose it and it's really important. Uh, I do love Gary Vaynerchuk's quote. I think it's in every single one of my keynotes now, that idea that trust is on the rise because transparency is on the rise. But it's also the key with that is, you know, um, transparency does not guarantee trust. Transparency allows people to see a window into who you are and they might trust that you're just an idiot. And that's what happens with transparency. So let's not, let's not make a mistake that because you all of a sudden embrace transparency, all of a sudden everybody trusts you. They might simply see into your inner soul and say, you're a lying sleazebag that borrows money from people and exploits people and ruins people's lives and careers because you care nothing but yourself. And just because you're transparent doesn't mean I'm going to trust you. Actually, because you're transparent, I'm going to expose who you are and make sure that doesn't happen to other people. And that is something that I think is overlooked when we're talking about trust and transparency is that element there. And transparency is difficult because we're not all perfect. And I don't think everybody is seeking perfection and trust doesn't require perfection, but trust does require authenticity. And unfortunately there's such a, a such a fine line there. So, um, and I love, I think live streaming does allow for a transparency like never before. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, Lindsay, uh, Victoria, I'll give you guys anything else you want to add in before we jump up about sign off. Yeah, no, I think you're right with what you're saying, like about trust, you know, we, um, we can all fall victim to it. Um, you know, we can, there's, there's people that we put trust in that then break our trust. Um, but again, I'll just relate it back to like celebrity for me. You know, we put these people in high positions and then they go and drink drive or they go and take drugs or they go and do something. And these, you know, you know, you've always, like you say, there's responsibility that comes within, within the position you're in. And I think it's important that, you know, when you've got that level of influence that you absolutely bang on, do nothing where you can you can reproach yourself. You know, you've got to, you've got to absolutely hold yourself in that highlight because people are watching you and resonating with you. And I have loved this discussion. You know why, why you know why most influencers are struggling today? And this is kind of shot across the bow is because I believe they've done a great job of faking it till they make it. And the reason that is, is it's really hard to continue to do that. There's a really hard to sustain about that. And then all of a sudden you get exposed and you're like, nobody cares. Nobody trusts me now. And it's like, well, you aren't the same person we thought you were. Now, granted, if you do embrace this idea of you are who you are and you like me or hate me, when you do become an influencer, the, 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 the scale back down is a lot shorter because you've already built up that idea that you, you are 100% who you are. But I think that's something that I think so many people, because they have been able to fake it and become really successful, yep. are, are then look at whenever they lose their influence, they're like, how the hell did I lose it? And I'm now a nothing. It's, well, you were really a nothing the whole time. You just perceived and, and tricked us into something. And now we realize that you are nothing. So I love it, Victoria. Yep. Such a great input there. Lindsay, what about you? Anything left? No, I, I think the same. I'm almost at the point where, I mean, I think, we're all, I think we're all at the point where we know that celebrities get paid to, to hawk this stuff. 
And so I almost, every time I see a celebrity like doing something, I automatically like don't want to buy it because I just assume that they're getting paid to do it. Um, I don't know if you guys remember a while ago, it was years ago where uh, I think P. Diddy was like, they do Ciroc vodka or something. And then he was all out in the club drinking a totally different kind of vodka. And that's when everyone was like, oh, he's just paid to drink that. He doesn't actually do it. So you get that kind of a situation with celebrities. So it's kind of just turned me off. I, I love just, it. Because you know what? If you buy a Lincoln because Matthew doing. McConaughey exactly. buys it, Matthew McConaughey is also my best friend. If you send me $100,000, um, I'll make sure to send you the products that he also drinks and buys as well. So please do that if you bought your Lincoln because Matthew McConaughey drives it. That would be um, just as relative for all of you fun people out there. So thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Victoria. Rachel Miller, I give you, uh, I tip my hat, my friend. Um, kudos, awesome subject. Um, we went with no guests, which is all, always a solo idea. We en I enjoy bantering back with you as always. But I will tell you, um, I loved this discussion. I love this topic. Um, I think we need to educate more people about it. I think this is only the beginning. Um, and I love it. I think, I think we're on, this is this won't be the last of this topic. So I'll give you kind of a final word as we sign off. And those that were asking for updates on Periscope Summit, I know I've been kind of ranting and, and citing that. I'm going to jump on Periscope as soon as this closes and give my um, recap on why takeaways of Periscope Summit. So um, feel free to follow me over there and, and I will do that on there. But we're going to let these lovely ladies get on with their day. We've already held everybody for an hour and a half. So Rachel Miller, I give it to you. As you know, thank you to everybody who's participated in these uh, discussions this month. Um, it is a really exciting topic for me because it's such a rapidly changing space. Um, I don't think we've come close to where it's going to be over the next few years. So, and these conversations help us hone it. It helps us make you know the work better as marketers. Um, so, if anybody has questions, definitely ping me on Twitter. I'm happy to keep this conversation going. Um, and stay tuned next month. Next month, we're talking social analytics, which as a tool junkie gets me super excited. We have some fun guests lined up. So see you all next week. Same time, same place.